The Indo-Pakistani War of 1965 was a culmination of skirmishes that took place between April 1965 and September 1965 between Pakistan and India. The conflict began following Pakistan's Operation Gibraltar, which was designed to infiltrate forces into Jammu and Kashmir to precipitate an insurgency against Indian rule. India retaliated by launching a full-scale military attack on West Pakistan. The 17-day war caused thousands of casualties on both sides and witnessed the largest engagement of armoured vehicles and the largest tank battle since World War II. Hostilities between the two countries ended after a United Nations mandated ceasefire was declared following diplomatic intervention by the Soviet Union and the United States, and the subsequent issuance of the Tashkent Declaration. Much of the war was fought by the country's land forces in Kashmir and along the border between India and Pakistan. This war saw the largest amassing of troops in Kashmir since the partition of British India in 1947, a number that was overshadowed only during the 2001–2002 military standoff between India and Pakistan. Most of the battles were fought by opposing infantry and armoured units, with substantial backing from air forces, and naval operations. Many details of this war, like those of other Indo Pakistani wars, remain unclear. India had the upper hand over Pakistan when the ceasefire was declared. Although the two countries fought to a standoff, the conflict is seen as a strategic and political defeat for Pakistan, as it had neither succeeded in fomenting insurrection in Kashmir nor had it been able to gain meaningful support at an international level. Internationally, the war was viewed in the context of the Greater Cold War, and resulted in a significant geopolitical shift in the subcontinent. Before the war, the United States and the United Kingdom had been major material allies of both India and Pakistan, as their primary suppliers of military hardware and foreign developmental aid. During and after the conflict, both India and Pakistan felt betrayed by the perceived lack of support by the Western powers for their respective positions. Those feelings of betrayal were increased with the imposition of an American and British embargo on military aid to the opposing sides. As a consequence, India and Pakistan openly developed closer relationships with the Soviet Union and China, respectively. The perceived negative stance of the Western powers during the conflict, and during the 1971 war, has continued to affect relations between the West and the subcontinent. In spite of improved relations with the US and Britain since the end of the Cold War, the conflict generated a deep distrust of both countries within the subcontinent which to an extent lingers to this day. Pre-war escalation Since the partition of British India in 1947, Pakistan and India remained in contention over several issues. Although the Kashmir conflict was the predominant issue dividing the nations, other border disputes existed, most notably over the Ran of Kutch, a barren region in the Indian state of Gujarat. The issue first arose in 1956 which ended with India regaining control over the disputed area. Pakistani patrols began patrolling in territory controlled by India in January 1965, which was followed by attacks by both countries on each other's posts on 8 April 1965. Initially involving border police from both nations, the disputed area soon witnessed intermittent skirmishes between the country's armed forces. In June 1965, British Prime Minister Harold Wilson successfully persuaded both countries to end hostilities and set up a tribunal to resolve the dispute. The verdict, which came later in 1968, saw Pakistan awarded 350 square miles 910 square kilometers of the Rand of Kutch, as against its original claim of 3,500 square miles 9, square kilometers. .After its success in the Rand of Kutch, Pakistan, under the leadership of General Ayub Khan, believed the Indian Army would be unable to defend itself against a quick military campaign in the disputed territory of Kashmir as the Indian military had suffered a loss to China in 19. 1962 in the Sino-Indian War. Pakistan believed that the population of Kashmir was generally discontented with Indian rule and that a resistance movement could be ignited by a few infiltrating saboteurs. Pakistan attempted to ignite the resistance movement by means of a covert infiltration, codenamed Operation Gibraltar. The Pakistani infiltrators were soon discovered, however, their presence reported by local Kashmiris, and the operation ended unsuccessfully. The war 
On 5 August 1965 between 26,000 and 33,000 Pakistani soldiers crossed the line of control dressed as Kashmiri locals headed for various areas within Kashmir. Indian forces, tipped off by the local populace, crossed the ceasefire line on 15 August. Initially, the Indian army met with considerable success, capturing three important mountain positions after a prolonged artillery barrage. By the end of August, however, both sides had relative progress. Pakistan had made progress in areas such as Tithwal, Uri, and Poonch, and India had captured the Haji Pir Pass, 8 km into Pakistan administered Kashmir. On 1 September 1965, Pakistan launched a counterattack, called Operation Grand Slam, with the objective to capture the vital town of Aknor in Jammu, which would sever communications and cut off supply routes to Indian troops. Ayub Khan calculated that Hindu morale would not stand more than a couple of hard blows at the right time and place." Although by this time Operation Gibraltar had failed and India had captured the Haji Pir Pass. At 3.30 hours, on 1 September 1965, the entire Cham area came under massive artillery bombardment. Pakistan had launched Operation Grand Slam and India's army headquarter was taken by surprise. Attacking with an overwhelming ratio of troops and technically superior tanks, Pakistan made gains against Indian forces, who were caught unprepared and suffered heavy losses. India responded by calling in its air force to blunt the Pakistani attack. The next day, Pakistan retaliated, its air force attacked Indian forces and air bases in both Kashmir and Punjab. India's decision to open up the theatre of attack into Pakistani Punjab forced the Pakistani army to relocate troops engaged in the operation to defend Punjab. Operation Grand Slam therefore failed, as the Pakistan army was unable to capture Aknor. It became one of the turning points in the war when India decided to relieve pressure on its troops in Kashmir by attacking Pakistan further south. In the valley, another area of strategic importance was Kargil. Kargil town was in Indian hands but Pakistan occupied high ground overlooking Kargil and Srinagar Leh Road. However, after the launch of a massive anti-infiltration operation by the Indian Army, the Pakistani infiltrators were forced out of that area in the month of August. India crossed the international border on the Western Front on 6 September On 6 September, the 15th Infantry Division of the Indian Army, under World War II veteran Major General Prasad, battled a massive counterattack by Pakistan near the west bank of the Ishogal Canal, BRB Canal which was a de facto border of India and Pakistan. The general's entourage itself was ambushed and he was forced to flee his vehicle. A second, this time successful, attempt to cross the Ikhagal Canal was made over the bridge in the village of Barki, just east of Lahore. These developments brought the Indian Army within the range of Lahore International Airport. As a result, the United States requested a temporary ceasefire to allow it to evacuate its citizens in Lahore. However, the Pakistani counterattack took Kem Karan from Indian forces which tried to divert the attention of Pakistanis from Kem Karan by an attack on Bedian and the adjacent villages. The thrust against Lahore consisted of the 1st Infantry Division supported by the three tank regiments of the 2nd Independent Armoured Brigade. They quickly advanced across the border, reaching the Ikhagal BRB Canal by 6 September. The Pakistani army held the bridges over the canal or blew up those it could not hold, effectively stalling any further advance by the Indians on Lahore. One unit of the Indian Jat Regiment, 3 Jat, had also crossed the Ishogal Canal and captured the town of Batapur Jalomur to Pakistan on the west side of the canal. The same day, a counter-offensive consisting of an armoured division and infantry division supported by Pakistan Air Force Sabres forced the Indian 15th Division to withdraw to its starting point. Although three Jat suffered minimal casualties, the bulk of the damage being taken by ammunition and stores vehicles, the higher commanders had no information of three Jat's capture of Batapur and misleading information led to the command to withdraw from Batapur and Dagrai to Gosal Dial. This move brought extreme disappointment to LT Colonel Desmond Haid, CO of three Jat. Dagrai was eventually recaptured by three Jat on 21 September, for the second time but after a much harder battle due to Pakistani reinforcements. On 8 September 1965, a company of five Maratha Light Infantry was sent to reinforce a Rajasthan Armed Constabulary post at Munabau, a strategic hamlet about 250 km from Jodhpur. Their brief was simple. 
to hold the post and to keep Pakistan's infantry battalions from overrunning the post at bay. But at Maratha Hill in Munabau, as the post has now been christened, the Indian company could barely manage to thwart the intense attack for 24 hours. A company of three guards with 954 heavy mortar battery ordered to reinforce the RAC post at Munabau could never reach. The Pakistani Air Force had strafed the entire area, and also hit a railway train coming from Barmer with reinforcements near Gadra Road railway station. On 10 September, Munabau fell into Pakistani hands, and efforts to capture the strategic point did not succeed. On the days following 9 September, both nations' premier formations were routed in unequal battles. India's 1st Armoured Division, labelled the ''Pride of the Indian Army'', launched an offensive towards Sialkot. The division divided itself into two prongs, was forced back by the Pakistani 6th Armoured Division at Chainda and was forced to withdraw after suffering heavy losses of nearly 100 tanks. The Pakistanis followed up their success by launching Operation Windup, which forced the Indians back farther. Similarly, Pakistan's pride, the 1st Armoured Division, pushed an offensive towards Kem Karan, with the intent to capture Amritsar a major city in Punjab, India and the bridge on River Bees to Jalandhar. The Pakistani 1st Armoured Division never made it past Kem Karan, however, and by the end of 10 September lay disintegrated by the defences of the Indian 4th Mountain Division at what is now known as the Battle of Asal Uttar lit, meaning, real answer, or more appropriate English equivalent fitting response. The area became known as Patan Nagar Patan Town, because of the large number of U.S.-made Pakistani Patan tanks. Approximately 97 Pakistani tanks were destroyed or abandoned, with only 32 Indian tanks destroyed or damaged. The Pakistani 1st Armoured Division less 5th Armoured Brigade was next sent to Sialkot sector behind Pakistani 6th Armoured Division where it didn't see action as 6th Armoured Division was already in process of routing Indian 1st Armoured Division which was superior to it in strength. The hostilities in the Rajasthan sector commenced on 8 September. Initially Pakistan Desert Force and the Her Militia followers of PIR Pagaro was placed in a defensive role, a role for which they were well suited as it turned out. The Hurs were familiar with the terrain and the local area and possessed many essential desert survival skills which their opponents and their comrades in the Pakistan army did not. Fighting as mainly light infantry, the Hur inflicted many casualties on the Indian forces as they entered Sindh. The Hurs were also employed as skirmishers, harassing the Indians' lock, a task they often undertook on camels. As the battle war on the Hurs and the desert force were increasingly used to attack and capture Indian villages inside Rajasthan, the war was heading for a stalemate, with both nations holding territory of the other. The Indian army suffered 3,000 battlefield deaths, while Pakistan suffered 3,800. The Indian Army was in possession of 758.9 miles squared 1,920 square kilometers of Pakistani territory and the Pakistan Army held 210 square miles 550 square kilometers of Indian territory. The territory occupied by India was mainly in the fertile Sialkot, Lahore and Kashmir sectors, while Pakistani ground gains were primarily in deserts opposite Sindh and in the Chumb sector near Kashmir. Pakistan claims that it held 1,600 square miles of Indian territory, while lost 450 square miles of its own territory. <inaudible> <inaudible> aerial warfare The war saw aircraft of the Indian Air Force and the Pakistan Air Force engaging in combat for the first time since independence. Although the two forces had previously faced off in the First Kashmir War during the late 1940s, that engagement was very limited in scale compared to the 1965 conflict. The IAF was flying large numbers of Hawker Hunters, Indian manufactured Fallen Nats, de Havilland Vampires, E. Canberra Bombers and a squadron of MiG-21s. The PAF's fighter force comprised 102 F 86 F Sabres and 12 F 104 Starfighters, along with 24 B 57 Canberra bombers. During the conflict, the PAF claimed it was outnumbered by around 5 to 1. The PAF's aircraft were largely of American origin, whereas the IAF flew an assortment of British and Soviet aeroplanes. It has been widely reported that the PAF's American aircraft were superior to those of the IAF. The F-86 was vulnerable to the diminutive fallen Nat, nicknamed Sabre Slayer. 
The Nat is credited by many independent and Indian sources as having shot down seven Pakistani Canadair Sabres in the 1965 war, while two Nats were downed by PAF fighters. The PAF's F-104 Starfighter of the PAF was the fastest fighter operating in the subcontinent at that time and was often referred to as the pride of the PAF. However, according to Sajad Haider, the F-104 did not deserve this reputation. Being a high-level interceptor designed to neutralize Soviet strategic bombers in altitudes above 40,000 feet. Rather than engage in dogfights with agile fighters at low altitudes, it was unsuited to the tactical environment of the region. In combat the Starfighter was not as effective as the IAF's far more agile, albeit much slower, fallen Nat fighter. Yet it zoomed into an ongoing dogfight between Sabres and Nats, at supersonic speed, successfully broke off the fight and caused the Nats to egress. An IAF Nat, piloted by squadron leader Bridge Pal Singh Sikand, landed at an abandoned Pakistani airstrip at Pasroor and was captured by the Pakistan Army. The pilot claimed that most of his equipment failed and even if he could get some chance on that, the starfighters snuffed it. This Nat is displayed as a war trophy in the Pakistan Air Force Museum, Karachi. Squadron LDR Saad Hatmi who flew the captured aircraft to Sargada, and later tested and evaluated its flight performance, was a view that Nat was no saber slayer when it came to dogfighting. The Pakistan Air Force had fought well in countering the much large Indian Air Force and supported the ground forces. The two countries have made contradictory claims of combat losses during the war and few neutral sources have verified the claims of either country. The PAF claimed it shot down 104 IAF planes and lost 19 of its own, while the IAF claimed it shot down 73 PAF planes and lost 59. According to PAF, it flew 86 F-86 Sabres, 10 F-104 Starfighters and 20 B-57 Canberras in a parade soon after the war was over. Thus disproving the IAF's claim of downing 73 PAF fighters, which at the time constituted nearly the entire Pakistani frontline fighter force. Indian sources have pointed out that, despite PAF claims of losing only a squadron of combat craft, Pakistan sought to acquire additional aircraft from Indonesia, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and China within 10 days of the beginning war. The two air forces were rather equal in the conflict, because much of the Indian Air Force remained farther east to guard against the possibility of China entering the war. According to the independent sources, the PAF lost some 20 aircraft while the Indians lost 60 to 75. Pakistan ended the war having depleted 17% of its front line strength, while India's losses amounted to less than 10%. Moreover, the loss rate had begun to even out, and it has been estimated that another three weeks fighting would have seen the Pakistani losses rising to 33% and India's losses totaling 15%. Air superiority was not achieved, and were unable to prevent IAF fighter bombers and reconnaissance Canberras from flying daylight missions over Pakistan. Thus 1965 was a stalemate in terms of the air war with neither side able to achieve complete air superiority. However, according to Kenneth Werrell, the Pakistan Air Force did well in the conflict and probably had the edge. When hostilities broke out, the Pakistan Air Force with around 100 F-86s faced an enemy with five times as many combat aircraft. The Indians were also equipped with comparatively modern aircraft inventory. Despite this, Werrell credits the PAF as having the advantage of a decade's experience with the Sabre and pilots with long flight hours experience. One Pakistani fighter pilot, Amal Lam, was credited with the record of downing five Indian aircraft in less than a minute, becoming the first known flying ace since the Korean War. However, his claims were never confirmed by the PAF and is disputed by Indian sources and some PAF officials. Tank battles The 1965 war witnessed some of the largest tank battles since World War II. At the beginning of the war, the Pakistani army had both a numerical advantage in tanks, as well as better equipment overall. Pakistani armor was largely American-made, it consisted mainly of Patton M47 and M48 tanks, but also included many M4 Sherman tanks, some M24 Chaffee light tanks and M36 Jackson tank destroyers, equipped with 90mm guns. 
The bulk of India's tank fleet were older M4 Sherman tanks, some were upgunned with the French high velocity CN 75 50 guns and could hold their own, whilst some older models were still equipped with the inferior 75mm M3 L 40 gun. Besides the M4 tanks, India fielded the British made Centurion tank Mk7, with the 105mm Royal Ordnance L7 gun, and the AMX 13, PT 76, and M3 Stuart light tanks. Pakistan fielded a greater number and more modern artillery, its guns outranged those of the Indian artillery, according to Pakistan's Major General T. H. Malik. At the outbreak of war in 1965, Pakistan had about 15 armoured cavalry regiments, each with about 45 tanks in three squadrons. Besides the Pattons, there were about 200 M4 Shermans re armed with 76mm guns, 150 M24 Chaffee light tank, and a few independent squadrons of M36 B1 tank destroyers. Most of these regiments served in Pakistan's two armoured divisions, the 1st and 6th Armoured Divisions, the latter being in the process of formation. The Indian Army of the time possessed 17 cavalry regiments, and in the 1950s had begun modernizing them by the acquisition of 164 AMX-13 light tanks and 188 Centurions. The remainder of the cavalry units were equipped with M4 Shermans and a small number of M3A3 Stuart light tanks. India had only a single armoured division, the 1st Black Elephant Armoured Division, which consisted of the 17th Horse the Pune Horse, also called Fakur i Hind Pride of India, the 4th Horse Hodson's Horse, the 16th Cavalry, the 7th Light Cavalry, the 2nd Lancers, the 18th Cavalry and the 62nd Cavalry, the two first named being equipped with Centurions. There was also the 2nd Independent Armoured Brigade, one of whose three regiments, the 3rd Cavalry, was also equipped with Centurions. Despite the qualitative and numerical superiority of Pakistani armour, Pakistan was outfought on the battlefield by India, which made progress into the Lahore Sialkot sector. Whilst halting Pakistan's counteroffensive on Amritsar, they were sometimes employed in a faulty manner, such as charging prepared defences during the defeat of Pakistan's 1st Armoured Division at Asal Uttar. After India breached the Matapur Canal on of September, the Kem Karan counter-offensive was halted, affecting Pakistan's strategy substantially. Although India's tank formations experienced some results, India's attack at the Battle of Chainda, led by its 1st Armoured Division and supporting units, was brought to halt by the newly raised 6th Armoured Division Independent Brigade Group in the Chainda sector. Pakistan claimed that Indians lost 120 tanks at Chainda, compared to 44 of its own but later, Indian official sources confirmed India lost only 29 tanks at Chainda. Neither the Indian nor Pakistani army showed any great facility in the use of armoured formations in offensive operations, whether the Pakistani 1st Armoured Division at Asal Uttar or the Indian 1st Armoured Division at Chainda. In contrast, both proved adept with smaller forces in a defensive role such as India's 2nd Armoured Brigade at Asal Uttar and Pakistan's 25th Cavalry at Chainda. The Centurion battle tank, with its 105mm gun and heavy armour, performed better than the overly complex patterns. <laughs> Naval hostilities Naval operations did not play a prominent role in the War of 1965. On 7 September, a flotilla of the Pakistan Navy under the command of Commodore S.M. Anwar, carried out a bombardment of the Indian Navy's radar station coastal down of Dwarka, which was 200 miles 320 kilometers south of the Pakistani port of Karachi. Operation Dwarka, as it is known, is a significant naval operation of the 1965 war contested as a nuisance raid by some. The attack on Dwarka led to questions being asked in India's parliament and subsequent post-war modernization and expansion of the Indian Navy, with an increase in budget from Rs. 35 crores to Rs. 115 crores, according to some Pakistani sources, one submarine, PNS Ghazi, kept the Indian Navy's aircraft carrier INS Vikrant besieged in Bombay throughout the war. Indian sources claim that it was not their intention to get into a naval conflict with Pakistan, and wish to restrict the war to a land-based conflict. Moreover, they note that the Vikrant was in dry dock in the process of refitting. Some Pakistani defence writers have also discounted claims that the Indian Navy was bottled up in Bombay by a single submarine, instead stating that 75% of the Indian Navy was under maintenance in harbour. Uh, 
Topic: <laughs> Covert Operations. The Pakistan Army launched a number of covert operations to infiltrate and sabotage Indian airbases. On 7 September 1965, the Special Services Group SSG commandos were parachuted into enemy territory. According to Chief of Army Staff General Muhammad Musa, about 135 commandos were airdropped at three Indian airfields Halwara, Pathankot and Adampur. The daring attempt proved to be an unmitigated disaster. Only 22 commandos returned to Pakistan as planned, 93 were taken prisoner including one of the commanders of the operations, Major Khalid Butt, and 20 were killed in encounters with the army, police or civilians. The reason for the failure of the commando mission is attributed to the failure to provide maps, proper briefings and adequate planning or preparation. Despite failing to sabotage the airfields, Pakistan sources claim that the commando mission affected some planned Indian operations. As the Indian 14th Infantry Division was diverted to hunt for paratroopers, the Pakistan Air Force found the road filled with transport and destroyed many vehicles. India responded to the covert activity by announcing rewards for captured Pakistani spies or paratroopers. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, rumors spread that India had retaliated with its own covert operations, sending commandos deep into Pakistan territory, but these rumors were later determined to be unfounded. Topic. Assessment of losses India and Pakistan make widely divergent claims about the damage they inflicted on each other and the amount of damage suffered by them. The following summarizes each nation's claims. Topic. Neutral assessments There have been several neutral assessments of the losses incurred by both India and Pakistan during the war. Most of these assessments agree that India had the upper hand over Pakistan when ceasefire was declared. Some of the neutral assessments are mentioned below. According to the Library of Congress Country Studies conducted by the Federal Research Division of the United States, the war was militarily inconclusive, each side held prisoners and some territory belonging to the other. Losses were relatively heavy. On the Pakistani side, 20 aircraft, 200 tanks, and 3,800 troops. Pakistan's army had been able to withstand Indian pressure, but a continuation of the fighting would only have led to further losses and ultimate defeat for Pakistan. Most Pakistanis, schooled in the belief of their own martial prowess, refused to accept the possibility of their country's military defeat by Hindu India and were, instead, quick to blame their failure to attain their military aims on what they considered to be the ineptitude of Ayub Khan and his government. Former New York Times reporter Arif Jamal wrote in his book Shadow War, This time, India's victory was nearly total, India accepted ceasefire only after it had occupied 740 square miles, though Pakistan had made marginal gains of 210 square miles of territory. Despite the obvious strength of the Indian winds, both countries claim to have been victorious. Devon T. Hagerty wrote in his book South Asia in World Politics, The invading Indian forces outfought their Pakistani counterparts and halted their attack on the outskirts of Lahore, Pakistan's second largest city. By the time United Nations intervened on September 22, Pakistan had suffered a clear defeat. In his book National Identity and Geopolitical Visions, Gertjan Dykink writes, The superior Indian forces, however, won a decisive victory and the army could have even marched on into Pakistani territory had external pressure not forced both combatants to cease their war efforts. An excerpt from Stanley Wolpert's India, summarizing the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965, in three weeks the Second Indo-Pak War ended in what appeared to be a draw when the embargo placed by Washington on U.S. ammunition and replacements for both armies forced cessation of conflict before either side won a clear victory. India, however, was in a position to inflict grave damage to, if not capture, Pakistan's capital of the Punjab when the ceasefire was called, and controlled Kashmir's strategic Uri Poonch Bulge, much to Ayub's chagrin. In his book titled The Greater Game, India's Race with Destiny and China, David Van Prague wrote, India won the war. It held on to the veil of Kashmir, the prize Pakistan vainly sought. 
It gained 1840 square kilometers, 710 square miles of Pakistani territory, 640 square kilometers, 250 square miles in Azad Kashmir, Pakistan's portion of the state, 460 square kilometers, 180 square miles of the Sialkot sector, 380 square kilometers, 150 square miles far to the south of Sindh, and most critical, 360 square kilometers, 140 square miles on the Lahore front. Pakistan took 540 square kilometers, 210 square miles of Indian territory, 490 square kilometers, 190 square miles in the Cham sector and 50 square kilometers, 19 square miles around Kem Karen. Dennis Coups India and the United States Estranged Democracies also provides a summary of the war. Although both sides lost heavily in men and material and neither gained a decisive military advantage, India had the better of the war. New Delhi achieved its basic goal of thwarting Pakistan's attempt to seize Kashmir by force. Pakistan gained nothing from a conflict which it had instigated. A region in turmoil, South Asian conflicts since 1947 by Robert Johnson mentions India's strategic aims were modest, it aimed to deny Pakistani army victory, although it ended up in possession of 720 square miles 1, square kilometers of Pakistani territory for the loss of just 220 square miles 570 square kilometers of its own. An excerpt from William M. Carpenter and David G. Veencheck's Asian Security Handbook, Terrorism and the New Security Environment. A brief but furious 1965 war with India began with a covert Pakistani thrust across the Kashmiri ceasefire line and ended up with the city of Lahore threatened with encirclement by Indian army. Another UN-sponsored ceasefire left borders unchanged, but Pakistan's vulnerability had again been exposed. English historian John Key's India, a history provides a summary of the 1965 war. The 1965 Indo-Pak war lasted barely a month. Pakistan made gains in the Rajasthan desert but its main push against India's Jammu Srinagar road link was repulsed and Indian tanks advanced to within a sight of Lahore. Both sides claimed victory but India had most to celebrate. UKHEO and Shale Asher Horowitz write in their book Conflict in Asia, Korea, China Taiwan, and India Pakistan Again India appeared, logistically at least, to be in a superior position but neither side was able to mobilize enough strength to gain a decisive victory. According to the Office of the Historian within the U.S. Department of State, Conflict resumed again in early 1965, when Pakistani and Indian forces clashed over disputed territory along the border between the two nations. Hostilities intensified that August when the Pakistani army attempted to take Kashmir by force. The attempt to seize the state was unsuccessful, and the Second India-Pakistan War reached a stalemate. Ceasefire The United States and the Soviet Union used significant diplomatic tools to prevent any further escalation in the conflict between the two South Asian nations. The Soviet Union, led by Premier Alexei Kosygin, hosted ceasefire negotiations in Tashkent now in Uzbekistan, where Indian Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri and Pakistani President Ayub Khan signed the Tashkent Agreement, agreeing to withdraw to pre-August lines no later than 25 February 1966. With declining stockpiles of ammunition, Pakistani leaders feared the war tilting in India's favour. Therefore, they quickly accepted the ceasefire in Tashkent. Despite strong opposition from Indian military leaders, India bowed to growing international diplomatic pressure and accepted the ceasefire. On the 22nd of September, the United Nations Security Council unanimously passed a resolution that called for an unconditional ceasefire from both nations. The war ended the following day. India's Prime Minister, Shastri, suffered a fatal heart attack soon after the declaration of the ceasefire. As a consequence, the public outcry in India against the ceasefire declaration transformed into a wave of sympathy for the ruling Indian National Congress. India and Pakistan accused each other of ceasefire violations. India charged Pakistan with 585 violations in 34 days, while Pakistan countered with accusations of 450 incidents by India. In addition to the expected exchange of small arms and artillery fire, India reported that Pakistan utilized the ceasefire to capture the Indian village of Chananwala in the Fazilka sector. 
This village was recaptured by Indian troops on 25 December. On 10 October, a B-57 Canberra on loan to the PAF was damaged by three SA-2 missiles fired from the IAF base at Ambala. A Pakistani Army Oster AOP was shot down on 16 December, killing one Pakistani Army captain. On 2 February 1967, an AOP was shot down by IAF hunters. The ceasefire remained in effect until the start of the Indo Pakistani War of 1971. <laughs> Public perceptions The ceasefire was criticized by many Pakistanis who, relying on fabricated official reports and the controlled Pakistani press, believed that the leadership had surrendered military gains. The protests led to student riots. Pakistan state's reports had suggested that their military was performing admirably in the war, which they incorrectly blamed as being initiated by India, and thus the Tashkent Declaration was seen as having forfeited the gains. Some recent books written by Pakistani authors, including one by ex Isi Chief Lieutenant General Mahmud Ahmed Durrani, initially titled The Myth of 1965 Victory, reportedly exposed Pakistani fabrications about the war, but all copies of the book were bought by Pakistan Army to prevent circulation because the topic was too sensitive. The book was published with the revised title History of Indo-Pak War 1965, published by Services Book Club, a part of the Pakistan military and printed by Oxford University Press, Karachi. A few copies of the book have survived. A version was published in India as Illusion of Victory, a military history of the Indo-Pak War 1965 by Lexicon Publishers. Recently a new Pakistani impression has been published in 2017. Topic. Intelligence failures Strategic miscalculations by both India and Pakistan ensured that the war ended in a stalemate. Topic. Indian miscalculations Indian military intelligence gave no warning of the impending Pakistan invasion. The Indian Army failed to recognize the presence of heavy Pakistani artillery and armaments in Chumb and suffered significant losses as a result. The Official War History 1965, drafted by the Ministry of Defense of India in 1992, was a long suppressed document that revealed other miscalculations. According to the document, on the 22nd of September when the Security Council was pressing for a ceasefire, the Indian Prime Minister asked Commanding Gen. Chaudhary if India could possibly win the war, were he to delay accepting the ceasefire. The general replied that most of India's frontline ammunition had been used up and the Indian army had suffered considerable tank losses. It was determined later that only 14% of India's frontline ammunition had been fired and India held twice the number of tanks as Pakistan. By this time, the Pakistani army had used close to 80% of its ammunition. Air Chief Marshal RETD PC Law who was the vice chief of air staff during the conflict points to the lack of coordination between the IAF and the Indian army neither side revealed its battle plans to the other the battle plans drafted by the ministry of defense and general chaudhary did not specify a role for the indian air force in the order of battle this attitude of gen chaudhary was referred to by acm law as the supremo syndrome a patronizing attitude sometimes held by the Indian Army towards the other branches of the Indian military. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Pakistani miscalculations. The Pakistani army's failures started with the supposition that a generally discontented Kashmiri people, given the opportunity provided by the Pakistani advance, would revolt against their Indian rulers, bringing about a swift and decisive surrender of Kashmir. The Kashmiri people, however, did not revolt. Instead, the Indian Army was provided with enough information to learn of Operation Gibraltar and the fact that the Army was battling not insurgents, as they had initially supposed, but Pakistani Army regulars. The Pakistani army also failed to recognize that the Indian policy makers would order an attack on the southern sector in order to open a second front. Pakistan was forced to dedicate troops to the southern sector to protect Sialkot and Lahore instead using them to support penetrating into Kashmir. Operation Grand Slam 
which was launched by Pakistan to capture Aknor, a town northeast of Jammu and a key region for communications between Kashmir and the rest of India, was also a failure. Many Pakistani commentators criticized the Ayub Khan administration for being indecisive during Operation Grand Slam. These critics claim that the operation failed because Ayub Khan knew the importance of Aknar to India having called it India's jugular vein and did not want to capture it and drive the two nations into an all-out war. Despite progress being made in Aknar, General Ayub Khan relieved the commanding Major General actor Hussain Malik and replaced him with Gen. Yahya Khan. A 24-hour lull ensued the replacement, which allowed the Indian Army to regroup in Aknar and successfully oppose a lackluster attack headed by General Yahya Khan. The enemy came to our rescue, asserted the Indian Chief of Staff of the Western Command. Later, actor Hussain Malik criticized Ayub Khan for planning Operation Gibraltar, which was doomed to fail, and for relieving him of his command at a crucial moment in the war. Malik threatened to expose the truth about the war and the army's failure, but later dropped the idea for fear of being banned. Some authors have noted that Pakistan might have been emboldened by a war game, conducted in March 1965, at the Institute of Defense Analysis, USA. The exercise concluded that, in the event of a war with India, Pakistan would win. Other authors like Stephen Philip Cohen, have consistently commented that the Pakistan army had acquired an exaggerated view of the weakness of both India and the Indian military. The 1965 war was a shock. Pakistani Air Marshal and Commander-in-Chief of PAF during the war, Noor Khan, later said that the Pakistan Army, and not India, should be blamed for starting the war. However propaganda in Pakistan about the war continued, the war was not rationally analyzed in Pakistan, with most of the blame being heaped on the leadership and little importance given to intelligence failures that persisted until the debacle of the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. Involvement of other nations The United States and the United Kingdom had been the principal suppliers of military materiel to India and Pakistan since 1947. Both India and Pakistan were Commonwealth republics. While India had pursued a policy of nominal non-alignment, Pakistan was a member of both Cento and Sito and a purported ally of the West in its struggle against communism. Well before the conflict began, however, Britain and the United States had suspected Pakistan of joining both alliances out of opportunism to acquire advanced weapons for a war against India. They had therefore limited their military aid to Pakistan to maintain the existing balance of power in the subcontinent. In 1959, however, Pakistan and the United States had signed an agreement of cooperation in 1959 under which the United States agreed to take appropriate action, including the use of armed forces, in order to assist the government of Pakistan at its request. By 1965, American and British analysts had recognized the two international groupings, Cento and Sito, and Pakistan's continued alliance with the West as being largely meaningless. Following the start of the 1965 war, both the United States and Britain took the view that the conflict was largely Pakistan's fault, and suspended all arms shipments to both India and Pakistan. While the United States maintained a neutral stance, the British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, condemned India for aggression after its army advanced towards Lahore. His statement was met with a furious rebuttal from India. Internationally, the level of support which Pakistan received was limited at best. Iran and Turkey issued a joint communique on 10 September which placed the blame on India, backed the United Nations' appeal for a ceasefire, and offered to deploy troops for a UN peacekeeping mission in Kashmir. Pakistan received support from Indonesia, Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia in the form of six naval vessels, jet fuel, guns and ammunition and financial support, respectively. Since before the war, the People's Republic of China had been a major military associate of Pakistan and a military opponent of India, with whom it had fought a brief war in 1962. China had also become a foreign patron for Pakistan and had given Pakistan $60 million in development assistance in 1965. During the war, China openly supported the Pakistani position. It took advantage of the conflict to issue a strongly worded ultimatum to India condemning its aggression. In Tibet and hinting at nuclear retaliation by China, China had exploded its first nuclear device the previous year. 
Despite strong fears of Chinese intervention on the side of Pakistan, the Chinese government ultimately exercised restraint. This was partly due to the logistical difficulties of a direct Chinese military intervention against India and India's improved military strength after its defeat by China in 1962. China had also received strong warnings by the American and Soviet governments against expanding the scope of the conflict by intervening. In the face of this pressure, China backed down, extending the deadline for India to respond to its ultimatum and warning India against attacking East Pakistan. Ultimately, Pakistan rejected Chinese offers of military aid, recognizing that accepting it would only result in further alienating Pakistan internationally. International opinion considered China's actions to be dangerously reckless and aggressive, and it was soundly rebuked in the world press for its unnecessarily provocative stance during the conflict. India's participation in the non aligned movement yielded little support from its members. Support given by Indonesia to Pakistan was seen as a major Indian diplomatic failure, as Indonesia had been among the founding members of the non-aligned movement along with India. Despite its close relations with India, the Soviet Union was more neutral than other nations during the war, inviting both nations to peace talks under its aegis in Tashkent. Aftermath India Despite the declaration of a ceasefire, India was perceived as the victor due to its success in halting the Pakistan-backed insurgency in Kashmir. In its October 1965 issue, the Time magazine quoted a Western official assessing the consequences of the war. Now it's apparent to everybody that India is going to emerge as an Asian power in its own right. In light of the failures of the Sino-Indian War, the outcome of the 1965 war was viewed as a politico-strategic victory in India. The Indian premier, Lal Bahadur Shastri, was hailed as a national hero in India, while the overall performance of the Indian military was praised. Military leaders were criticized for their failure to effectively deploy India's superior armed forces so as to achieve a decisive victory over Pakistan. In his book War in the Modern World since 1815, noted war historian Jeremy Black said that though Pakistan lost heavily during the 1965 war, India's hasty decision to call for negotiations prevented further considerable damage to the Pakistan armed forces. He elaborates, India's chief of army staff urged negotiations on the ground that they were running out ammunition and their number of tanks had become seriously depleted. In fact, the army had used less than 15% of its ammunition compared to Pakistan, which had consumed closer to 80% and India had double the number of serviceable tanks. In 2015, Marshal of the Indian Air Force Aryan Singh, the last surviving armed force commander of the conflict, gave his assessment that the war ended in a stalemate, but only due to international pressure for a ceasefire, and that India would have achieved a decisive victory had hostilities continued for a few days more. For political reasons, Pakistan claims victory in the 1965 war. In my opinion, the war ended in a kind of stalemate. We were in a position of strength. Had the war continued for a few more days, we would have gained a decisive victory. I advised then Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri not to agree for ceasefire. But I think he was under pressure from the United Nations and some countries. As a consequence, India focused on enhancing communication and coordination within and among the tri-services of the Indian Armed Forces, partly as a result of the inefficient information gathering preceding the war. India established the Research and Analysis Wing for External Espionage and Intelligence. Major improvements were also made in command and control to address various shortcomings and the positive impact of these changes was clearly visible during the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 when India achieved a decisive victory over Pakistan within two weeks. China's repeated threats to intervene in the conflict in support of Pakistan increased pressure on the government to take an immediate decision to develop nuclear weapons. Despite repeated assurances, the United States did little to prevent extensive use of American arms by Pakistani forces during the conflict, thus irking India. At the same time, the United States and United Kingdom refused to supply India with sophisticated weaponry which further strained the relations between the West and India. 
These developments led to a significant change in India's foreign policy. India, which had previously championed the cause of non alignment, distanced itself further from Western powers and developed close relations with the Soviet Union. By the end of the 1960s, the Soviet Union emerged as the biggest supplier of military hardware to India. From 1967 to 1977, 81% of India's arms imports were from the Soviet Union. After the 1965 war, the arms race between India and Pakistan became even more asymmetric and India was outdistancing Pakistan by far. Topic: <laughs> Pakistan. At the conclusion of the war, many Pakistanis considered the performance of their military to be positive. The 6th of September is celebrated as Defence Day in Pakistan, in commemoration of the successful defence of Lahore against the Indian Army. The performance of the Pakistani Air Force, in particular, was praised. However, the Pakistani government was accused by foreign analysts of spreading disinformation among its citizens regarding the actual consequences of the war. In his book Mainsprings of Indian and Pakistani Foreign Policies, S.M. Burke writes, after the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965 the balance of military power had decisively shifted in favour of India. Pakistan had found it difficult to replace the heavy equipment lost during that conflict while her adversary, despite her economic and political problems, had been determinedly building up her strength. Most observers agree that the myth of a mobile, hard-hitting Pakistan army was badly dented in the war, as critical breakthroughs were not made. Several Pakistani writers criticized the military's ill-founded belief that their martial race of soldiers could defeat Hindu India in the war. Rasul Bukhs Rais, a Pakistani political analyst wrote, The 1965 war with India proved that Pakistan could neither break the formidable Indian defenses in a blitzkrieg fashion nor could she sustain an all-out conflict for long. Historian Akbar S. Zaidi notes that Pakistan lost terribly in the 1965 war." The Pakistan Air Force on the other hand gained a lot of credibility and reliability among Pakistan military and international war writers for successful defense of Lahore and other important areas of Pakistan and heavy retaliation to India on the next day. The alertness of the Air Force was also related to the fact that some pilots were scrambled six times in less than an hour on indication of Indian air raids. The Pakistan Air Force along with the Army is celebrated on Defence Day and Air Force Day in commemoration of this in Pakistan 6 and 7 September respectively. Moreover, Pakistan had lost more ground than it had gained during the war and, more importantly, failed to achieve its goal of capturing Kashmir. This result has been viewed by many impartial observers as a defeat for Pakistan. Many senior Pakistani officials and military experts later criticized the faulty planning of Operation Gibraltar, which ultimately led to the war. The Tashkent Declaration was also criticized in Pakistan, though few citizens realized the gravity of the situation that existed at the end of the war. Political leaders were also criticized. Following the advice of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, Pakistan's foreign minister, Ayub Khan had raised very high expectations among the people of Pakistan about the superiority, if not invincibility, of its armed forces, but Pakistan's inability to attain its military aims during the war created a political liability for Ayub. The defeat of its Kashmiri ambitions in the war led to the army's invincibility being challenged by an increasingly vocal opposition. One of the farthest reaching consequences of the war was the wide scale economic slowdown in Pakistan. The war ended the impressive economic growth Pakistan had experienced since the early 1960s. Between 1964 and 1966, Pakistan's defense spending rose from 4.82% to 9.86% of GDP, putting a tremendous strain on Pakistan's economy. By 1970-71, defense spending comprised a whopping 55.66% of government expenditure. According to veterans of the war, the war greatly cost Pakistan economically, politically, and militarily. Nuclear theorist Feroz Khan maintained that the 1965 war was a last conventional attempt to snatch Kashmir by military force, and Pakistan's own position in the international community, especially with the United States, began to deteriorate from the point the war started, while on the other hand, the alliance with China saw improvements. Chairman Joint Chiefs General Tariq Majid claims in his memoirs that Cho N. Lai had long advised the government in the classic style of Sun Tzu. 
to go slow, not to push India hard, and avoid a fight over Kashmir, for at least, 20 to 30 years, until you have developed your economy and consolidated your national power." General Majid maintained in eating grass that the "...sane, philosophical and political critical thinking." was missing in Pakistan, and that the country had lost extensive human resources by fighting the war. Pakistan was surprised by the lack of support from the United States, an ally with whom the country had signed an agreement of cooperation. The U.S. turned neutral in the war when it cut off military supplies to Pakistan and India, an action that the Pakistanis took as a sign of betrayal. After the war, Pakistan would increasingly look towards China as a major source of military hardware and political support. Another negative consequence of the war was growing resentment against the Pakistani government in East Pakistan present-day Bangladesh, particularly for West Pakistan's obsession with Kashmir. Bengali leaders accused the central government of not providing adequate security for East Pakistan during the conflict, even though large sums of money were taken from the East to finance the war for Kashmir. In fact, despite some Pakistan Air Force attacks being launched from bases in East Pakistan during the war, India did not retaliate in that sector, although East Pakistan was defended only by an understrengthened infantry division 14th Division, 16 planes and no tanks. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was critical of the disparity in military resources deployed in East and West Pakistan, calling for greater autonomy for East Pakistan, an action that ultimately led to the Bangladesh Liberation War and another war between India and Pakistan in 1971. Pakistan celebrates Defence Day every year to commemorate 6 September 1965 to pay tribute to the soldiers killed in the war. However, Pakistani journalists, including Taha Siddiqui and Hasib Asif have criticized the celebration of Defence Day. <laughs> <laughs> Military awards Battle <laughs> honours <laughs> 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 After the war, a total of 16 battle honours and three theatre honours were awarded to units of the Indian Army, the notable amongst which are <laughs> Gallantry awards For bravery, the following soldiers were awarded the highest gallantry award of their respective countries, the Indian award Param Veer Chakra and the Pakistani award Nishan e Haider. India Company Quartermaster Havildar Abdul Hamid posthumous Lieutenant Colonel Ardashir Burzorji Tarapur posthumous Pakistan Major Raja Aziz Badi Shahid posthumous Topic See also Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 Post-World War II air-to-air combat losses equals equals notes